Hello and welcome to the International Daily Roundup by People's Dispatch, where we bring you major news developments from around the world. Our headlines, coup in Guinea leads to overthrow of government, six Palestinian prisoners dig a tunnel and escape from Israeli prison, organizations demand an arms embargo in Israel, and in our video section we take a look at the importance of the Central Asian region in the aftermath of the US withdrawal from Afghanistan. In our first story in a coup in Guinea, armed forces captured President Alpha Conde and announced their dissolution of the government on Sunday. At least two people were wounded in heavy gunfire in and around the presidential palace at the capital Conakry during the arrest of the president. The coup leader, Colonel Mamadi Dambuya, a television broadcast declared that the armed forces had taken over control of the country and dissolved the government led by President Conde. He also announced a dissolution of the constitution and said that military leaders would run the country. The group of soldiers who carried out the coup called themselves the National Com- Com- Committee for Reconciliation and Development. They released a video assuring that Conde is safe and in their custody. They also announced a national curfew and invited outgoing ministers and former presidents of institutions for a meeting on Monday. Conde, who is 83 years old, won his third presidential term in the elections held in October 2020 and was declared president on November 7th. The opposition had alleged fraud during the elections. His decision to amend the constitution, which had a two-term presidential limit, to contest again for the third term in March 2020 had resulted in massive opposition-led demonstrations across the country. The protests were suppressed using force in which dozens of protesters died and hundreds were arrested. However, several regional and global leaders condemned the coup and asked the military to release the president. The Economic Community of West African States, or ECOWAS, threatened to impose sanctions. United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres asked the coup leaders to release Conde immediately, saying that he was personally following the situation. Several activists and rights groups in Africa also condemned the coup, with some claiming that it is backed by foreign powers, such as the ex-colonial power France and the US. There are claims that the coup leader Domboya and others had links to and in some cases were trained by the US Africa Command. In our next story, six Palestinian prisoners who were being held in the Gilboa prison in northern Israel managed to escape overnight by digging a tunnel in their cell that led out of the prison complex. Local news reported that at least four of the prisoners were serving life sentences. Palestinians from various walks of society hailed the prisoners' escape with many calling it heroic and a blow against the Israeli military. Israeli prison authorities later claimed that they did not detect the escape till 4 a.m. on Monday during a headcount. According to the authorities, the prisoners had dug a hole below a toilet in their shared cell. The other end of the tunnel was situated a few meters away from the prison walls and was covered with weeds. According to reports, one of the prisoners, Zakari Zubedi, was a former commander of the Fatah Party's Al-Aqsa Martyrs Brigade based in Jenin. The other five prisoners were members of the Palestinian Islamic Jihad Resistance Group. Four of them were serving life sentences for alleged attacks on Israeli citizens and have been in prison since the, since the mid-90s and early 2000s. Kadura Fares, the head of the Palestinian Prisoners Club, an organization which works for the advancement of prisoners' rights, said that we are happy with this escape. We have called a lot for the necessity of liberating all Palestinian prisoners. If the prisoners can free themselves, this is a great thing, Al Jazeera reported. Fauzi Barhum, spokesperson for Hamas, also hailed the escape, calling it a real challenge to the occupation. Islamic Jihad, in a statement, termed the escape an utter failure for the occupation army and a strong slap to the Israeli military and the whole Israeli system. Continuing with Israel, over 100 international rights organizations and civil society members called upon the state's parties to arms trade treaty or the ATT to impose an arms embargo on Israel for its violation of the rights of Palestinians and international humanitarian law. Organizations including the Adala Justice Project, Other Made Prisoner Support and Human Rights Association, al Mezan Center for Human Rights, U.S. Campaign for the Academic and Cultural Boycott of Israel, the Israeli Committee Against House Demolitions and Jewish Voice for Peace are signatories to the letter. The letter mentions several recent cases of Israeli violence against Palestinians, such as the airstrikes on Gaza in May that lasted 11 days. They also noted the wave of ongoing Israeli attacks on Palestinian residents in several East Jerusalem neighborhoods such as Sheikh Jarrah. The signatories call for all ATT state parties to immediately terminate any current and prohibit future transfers of conventional arms, munitions, parts and components to Israel. The letter cites various articles of the ITT that, ATT that prohibit the transfer of arms when used to commit genocide, crimes against humanity or other war crimes as defined by international agreements to which they are a party. It also highlights that failing to act according to the ATT and international law only contributes to the ever-increasing suffering of the Palestinian people. And finally, in our video section, we take a look at the importance of Central Asia in the aftermath of the US withdrawal from Afghanistan. The region has been key for a variety of reasons, including its natural resources and proximity to Russia and China. We bring you an excerpt of an interview with NewsClick's Prabir Purkayasa on this issue. Afghanistan has always been thought to be strategically important, not only because it abuts South Asia, of course, India and Pakistan, but it also abuts West Asia and, as you said, 
Central it, Asia. Right. It also abuts China, which has always been a target. And in the time that Soviet Union existed, Central Asia part was really either Soviet Union or China. So that was the thrust of Afghanistan for the United States, right. that this was a direct intervention, perhaps a gateway to intervention into then what was Soviet Union and what was the Xinjiang province, as we know, also Tibet. Right. So this is one part of it. And let's not forget that the United States had an ongoing war at the time with Iran, virtually. And uh, after the particular the hostage crisis, this was also declared by Carter. Carter had two very important declarations. One declaration was entire oil in West Asia was a security interest of the United States. Anybody intervening with that will be then crossing the red lines of the United States, the trip lines of the United States. So declaring West Asia's oil as essentially belonging to United States in some sense. So that was one. And it was important because dollar was underpinned by oil. Right. And therefore, dollar was extremely important for US financial control, which it wanted to assert of the, over the world, which it did assert after the fall of Soviet Union particularly. Second was, as you have noted, Central Asia, because it was gateway to what after the fall of Soviet Union becomes what are called the various stans, Kazakhstan, Azerbaijan, uh, Turkmenistan, etc., etc., etc. And that, a lot of them about Central Asia. Now, what's important of Central Asia is something people do not understand. But if you look at the Euro Eurasian landmass, you have Western Europe, which is not very big. It only looks, looks bigger on a Mercator map. But if you look at what is called the equal area projections, then you will find it's not that big an area. It's a relatively small part of the world. But you have Central Asia, which is pretty large, and you have a number of countries in which the United States wanted to intervene after the Soviet Union fell. Now, increasingly, that has weakened. Over the years, Russia has re-emerged. Right. You have China right. also emerging. And with the Belt Road Initiative, the economies of these countries may get unlocked in a way that earlier wasn't possible. There are also gas and oil pipelines in these areas. And if you look at the essentially the mineral wealth of these areas, including gas fields, oil fields, connectivity to Russia and to China would really unlock a lot of right. these resources for these countries and for also their growth, integration to the global economy. So if we look at all of that, apart from the mineral riches of Afghanistan, which I think is going to take a lot longer to come into play. Uh, if you look at that, the other issues also are, for instance, the agricultural produces of right. this country. So if they get an access to both the Chinese and the West Asian, as well as uh, in West Asia, the Iranian market, and Iran is a big country with a presence in this region, Turkey is also abutting this region. So it has also some interest, particularly because a lot of Turkic-speaking tribes right. or <laughs> Turkic-speaking population in these areas, so including in uh, Afghanistan itself. So if you take all of that into account, I think this region is going to play a very important geopolitical right. and economic role. And that is where the United States really wanted to have a presence through Afghanistan. That's what Brzezinski says, and that's what it really was. Okay. Afghanistan, particularly with the Iran imbroglio, and the fact that Iran was an enemy for the United States, I think that was also in the uh, crosshairs of the United States when they intervened in Afghanistan. Don't forget the Iraq invasion followed soon after. So West Asia was definitely in the play. But Central Asia, yes, of course, because already you have Turkmenistan, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, all of them abutting uh, on the north, uh, Afghanistan. Right. And then, of course, you have a long border with Iran. You have a very small border with China. And also you have a border with, Afghan uh, with Pakistan. Of course, India is supposedly having a border. But as you know, that's really at the moment under control of Pakistan. <clears throat> so given this, I think we are seeing United States having a rather weak hand right. after the intervention in Afghanistan comes to an end. Right. I don't think it has ready-made spaces for itself to insert in the, now the, the stance, as they've exactly. been called. Right. And this is really going to get more integrated with Iran on one side, with Russia on the other side, China on the other side, and possibly 
Turkey as a question mark. What have what do they do in this period? Right. That's all we have time for today. We'll be back tomorrow with more news from around the world. Until then, keep watching People's Dispatch. Thank you.